Um, I would like to start out first by echoing much of what Katie has already said, um, that I'm really thankful to the Seda family for this award and for recognizing my accomplishments. I'm going to completely switch up the topic um, and talk about some of my doctoral research, which is engineering three-dimensional embryonic stem cell differentiation and morphogenesis. So if I start out by kind of putting this in the context of regenerative medicine, one of the central aims of regenerative medicine is to use some sort of cell source which can be expanded in vitro and finally um, transplanted back into the body to treat array, an array of degenerative diseases and traumatic injuries. For example, myocardial infarct, uh, where there is damaged tissue that could be restored by um, cellular therapies. However, it's very important to note that when we start talking about these sorts of therapies, that there have been <laughs> estimates thrown around out there that to re replace the amount of myocardium that's often damaged after MI, you would need on the order of a billion cells. So this makes the whole cell sourcing part of this not a real trivial problem. So our lab works with embryonic stem cells. Um, these are potentially interesting in this context because they can produce the large numbers of cells that we may need for such therapies. Um, embryonic stem cells are, are isolated from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst stage of an embryo um, and can be cultured indefinitely um, due to their ability to indefinitely self-renew in culture. Also interestingly, in contrast to other stem cell populations that you often hear about, adult stem cells, which are multipotent on this spectrum, Embryonic stem cells are pluripotent, which means that they can go on to differentiate toward all three germ lineages and ultimately drive all somatic cell types. This makes them not only a source of a large quantity of cells, but a whole different array of different cell types, which may not be readily available in different contexts. So as I've said, there, the cell biology behind stem cells and applications kind of fall at two ends of the spectrum. And as in the field of stem cell engineering, where we work, we're kind of at the interface of these two areas, where what we're trying to do is really understand, um, control, and perturb different aspects of the stem cell microenvironment um, to direct differentiation. And we're also, on the other end, trying to keep in mind some of the greater principles um, that may be required to actually make this translation down to applications, um, such as bioprocessing and scalability of these different um, cell uh, therapies. So in our context, we are interested in the differentiation of the embryonic stem cells. And this can be accomplished across a whole range of different formats, but the one that we're really interested in is in the spheroid format. These are termed embryoid bodies, and they arise because in the undifferentiated pluripotent state, embryonic stem cells express the cell adhesion marker E cadherin. So the cells will actually spontaneously aggregate into these spheroids, um, which makes them a three-dimensional culture. It's interesting from the perspective of looking at cell yields because they're not no longer constrained by the surface area of a petri dish like the monolayer cultures are. Um, and so we can think about this being a much more scalable approach to differentiating our embryonic stem cells. Um, and this is, is shown by the whole array of different scales with which we can culture these. All the way at the low end, you can have a single embryo body and a single drop on the lid of a petri dish, all the way up to a large scale bioreactor um, starting to think about these kind of scalable bioprocesses that would be required for therapeutic applications. Our lab works right in the center here where we use more of a bench scale approach. Um, we have both static cultures of just suspension um, embryo bodies, but we also work on this rotary orbital culture platform here, which actually does impart hydrodynamic forces and fluid mixing, um, which approximates some of the general <coughs> principles that would be applicable to a larger scale bioprocessing system. Um, but on the bench top scale, so that we are actually able to look at a number of parameters in parallel. I think per, uh, perhaps even more interesting than that also is that when these embryonic stem cells are aggregated into a three-dimensional structure, the, they actually form their own three-dimensional microenvironment. The cells um, are able to associate with one another and undergo different types of remodeling. And these are three of the perhaps most striking um, examples that have arisen in the past year or so. Um, and these examples show that with, in all of these cases, very minimal manipulation. Um, in culture, these stem cells under, underwent morphogenesis and formed structures that were structurally similar, expressed a lot of the same markers, and actually, in many cases, were functionally similar to um, native tissues. And so this is potentially very interesting to understand how to actually form tissues that may be actual functional tissues for regenerative therapies. So if we start thinking as engineers about how to direct stem cell fate, 
One of the obvious answers that has been very widely explored in the stem cell field is delivering soluble morphogens to our cultures. Um, however, it's important to note, and I think this has become more and more important over time, that these stem cells are dynamically changing over time. And so there's a temporal element in, um, involved in this in which we have to really understand when, we, when would we onset this um, soluble morphogen delivery and with what duration. And moreover, when we start thinking about embryoid bodies and the fact that they are a three-dimensional structure, we also have spatial elements within the local microenvironment where the delivery of different molecules may actually be spatially different. Going on somewhat at the same time as all of these things are endogenous remodeling responses where the, sem the stem cells are actually responding to and um, altering their local microenvironments as well. This is done through just paracrine signaling between different stem cell populations, as well as the remodeling and um, signaling downstream of different so sorts of adhesions. And so clearly this is very complex and a lot of these things are going on all at once within our three-dimensional microenvironment. So if we come back to the just general picture of an embryoid body, many people have looked at this but it's most often been used more as a tool um, just to induce differentiation and really just look at these differentiated phenotypes. But the way that we've looked at this is really questioning what's going on within this three-dimensional structure during the course of differentiation. And we have the hypothesis that if we're able to really understand and characterize more of this microenvironment, that we can develop new engineering approaches for directing the differentiation of our embryonic stem cells into these three-dimensional functional microtissue structures. So I'm going to illustrate this through a couple of different examples um, th of my work that kind of highlight a couple of, um, a couple of areas that I've explored. The first of which is looking at just the spheroid composition itself. Um, this is in the line of the way that cells are associating with one another and the way that they're remodeling their microenvironment. So first, um, as I had discussed, we use the rotary orbital culture platform, which is a hydrodynamic mixing. And one of the earliest things that we actually noticed was that as you change the speed with which this mixing is occurring, it actually changes the way the embryo bodies form. The cells associate at different speeds just because of the um, changes in the collisions between cells. So at the lowest rotary orbital speed that we've looked at, um, there's actually, the embryo bodies form very quickly. And as you increase the speed, they form much more slowly. Um, and this is interesting because we then saw that that changes the dynamics of E. cadherin expression. And even more than that, downstream of it, uh, beta-catenin expression. Beta-catenin is interesting because it's actually a signaling molecule. And you can see that its transcriptional activity is then dynamically modulated during the course of differentiation, um, just based on this very simple hydrodynamic parameter. Um, we've actually been able to, through this work, kind of develop a model where um, the intercellular aggregation of the stem cells modulates beta-catenin at these very early time points, day three of differentiation, and <coughs> then long term, of uh, course, across like 10 days of differentiation, we actually see changes in the, the final differentiated phenotypes, particularly towards cardiac lineages. And as I said, um, you see <coughs> the differences in the relative proportion of differentiation just based on the simple hydrodynamic parameters. But it's important to note that there's multiple things going on at once here. Um, not only is, are the aggregation kinetics changing, but also the size of the embryo bodies are significantly different over the course of differentiation. And we have different environments, which are going to naturally impart different shear stresses on these embryo bodies. So one of the first things that I, I sought to look at was, can we parse apart some of these variables that are all changing within this culture system? Um, and really be able to look at the culture environment independent of the embryo body size and formation. So the way that we went about doing this is by controlling the way these embryo bodies form. We form our embryo bodies by simple centrifugation into PDMS microwells, which allows us to control the formation kinetics and control the size of the embryo bodies. And then after that, we transfer them onto our rotary orbital platform to look at the microenvironment. So using the PDMS microwells, we're able to very precisely control the size of the embryo bodies simply by just changing the number of cells that we seed per well. Um, these embryo bodies are clearly different sizes, and the populations themselves end up being very uniform, which helps us to standardize our cultures a bit. One of the first things that we noticed was that when we move these onto the rotary orbital platform, 
If you left them at very low speeds or in static culture, the individual embryoid bodies started agglomerating with one another and over the course of seven days ended up with these very large amorphous masses of cells or very large embryoid bodies. Um, however, looking across a range of speeds, we were able to note that above a certain hydrodynamic threshold, we could actually keep these embryoid bodies individual with homogeneous populations of very similar sizes. So if we come back to those embryoid bodies that were formed at different sizes initially, we can see that even after seven days, we maintain relatively homogeneous populations, and the, the uh, relative sizes between them that we saw at that first time point are maintained during differentiation, and they, do not, um, uh, they don't show really any evidence of substantial agglomeration between these embryoid bodies. So what we've been able to do through this work is actually develop a platform where we combined the forced aggregation with rotary orbital culture and what this can do is really control the embryoid body microenvironment to allow us to ask further questions about some of the other parameters that are changing. So we came back to our, uh, the actual rotary orbital speeds to understand how the, the fluid environment actually will change differentiation. And we did see through the course of these experiments, although there were some changes that were much more subtle after we controlled the size, that the, um, there were differences in <coughs> both the relative proportion of differentiated cells as well as the spatial localization of the differentiated cells, um, indicating to us that hydrodynamics may actually be playing a significant role in the differentiation of embryonic stem cells. Um, and we've seen, or we've thought a lot about the scale up in bioreactors and the fact that these sorts of systems actually do impart mixing, but it's also important to note that as we start to scale down also, that there are a lot of systems um, more and more employ employing different types of fluidics. So these sorts of principles that we've identified through this may actually be important across a whole range of different applications for stem cell differentiation. So now that I've told you that the spheroid composition, composition does make a difference, but that we're able to control it, um, I will move on to just d giving you a brief um, look into what we've done with trying to deliver some morphogens um, within this embryoid body microenvironment. So we approach this with a relatively standard protocol of just delivering a single morphogen, um, bone morphogenetic protein 4. And as we uh, had seen in the literature, this induces increase in mesoderm differentiation as shown by upregulation of a whole bunch of mesoderm genes. Um, but what was really striking that we weren't necessarily expecting was the dramatic change in morphogenesis that happened within these embryoid bodies. You can see that when the <coughs> embryoid bodies are maintained in a basal serum-free media, that the cells are very tightly packed and very epithelial-like. However, when induced to differentiate towards mesoderm lineages um, in the presence of BMP4, what we saw was these cells becoming much more elongated, much more mesenchymal-like, and we actually then also saw evidence of um, gag deposition and smooth muscle actin expression indicating that these cells may be undergoing some sort of an epithelial to mesenchymal-like transition. So from this, we're able to say that we can treat our embryoid bodies with a soluble morphogen, BMP4, and we can change the differentiation. But in the process, we're also dramatically changing the entire physical composition of the embryoid body microenvironment by inducing this morphogenesis. So one way to look a little bit more at how we change the embryoid body microenvironment is by looking at some of the bulk um, mechanical properties of our embryoid bodies. We've done this using a micron scale material testing system where we can um, measure the force under user defined displacements to get an idea of the bulk properties of these embryoid bodies. We saw um, after seven days of differentiation, as we had seen qualitatively, the embryoid body diameter was increased um, upon BMP4 treatment, consistent with a lot of the morphogenesis happening within these embryoid bodies. But what was striking was the significant differences in the stiffness and the viscoelastic properties um, when these embryoid bodies were differentiated towards the mesoderm lineages. It's also interesting to note that not only were these different between the groups, but this is a dynamic process that's actually changed over the entire course of differentiation, um, indicating that the morphogenesis is an ongoing and dynamic process. So to look a little bit closer at what exactly was mediating these sorts of dynamic changes, we um, first turned to the cytoskeleton, since that's a natural place to look for mechanical stiffness. Um, what we did was we treated our embryoid bodies with a rock inhibitor, which decreases cytoskeletal tension. So upon decrease in cytoskeletal tension, you see that the stiffness of the embryoid bodies is significantly decreased, um, indicating that a large amount of the, the stiffness that we're actually measuring with this uh, method is, is due to the cytoskeleton.
But what was also interesting was that there's actually differences between our two groups and as early as two days of differentiation, <coughs> indicating that there may actually be something different going on even from early time points within these structures. To look just a little bit more closely, we also use different types of agonists and antagonists of the actin cytoskeleton to ask questions about how, um, cult how these assemb this assembly or disassembly influences the actual morphogenesis of embryoid bodies. And so if we look first at actin assembly, you can see that assembling the actin um, or forcing actin assembly increases the stiffness in a basal condition as we would expect, but it actually didn't have any effects on the BMP4 treated embryoid bodies. Um, on the other hand, if we disassemble the actin using a couple of different inhibitors, we don't see any effect in the basal conditions, but we saw um, divergent effects um, in the BMP4 treated embryoid bodies. And what we're doing right now is we have work ongoing to really try to understand a little bit more quantitatively the relationship between the stiffness, the cytoskeleton, and how that influences both the morphogenesis within the embryoid bodies as well as the cell fate. So the last thing that we've been able to appreciate as we start to understand that there's a dynamic morphogenesis occurring within these embryoid bodies is that the structure is actually changing over time and therefore its response to soluble morphogens may actually change as well. Um, some of the earliest uh, studies in our lab actually looked at um, scanning electron microscopy of embryoid bodies and you can see that they're actually during the course of differentiation um, very tight cell-cell junctions arise at the exterior of our embryoid bodies. And even more than that, there's actually this almost shell-looking structure at the exterior, which may be inhibiting um, the transport of molecules from the outside into the embryoid bodies. Um, in addition to that, we also are seeing a dramatic change in the size of our embryoid bodies over time. Um, and those things together actually may alter the distribution of different molecules within the embryoid bodies, not just morphogens that I'm delivering, but also nutrients and metabolites and like paracrine signals between cells. So one way that we've uh, um, started looking at this is in collaboration with Ari Glazer's group in mechanical engineering, where we have developed a bioreactor system where we can actually measure the pressure drop across em individual embryoid bodies um, as a function of fluid flow to get an idea of what the resistance is to fluid flow in these embryoid bodies. What was interesting is that even as early as four days of differentiation and thereafter, there's a significant increase in fluidic resistance indicating that as early as 40s of differentiation, we may actually be seeing um, limitations of transport within our embryoid body structures. And this changes the way that we have to start thinking about soluble delivery of morphogens within our embryoid bodies because the dynamic nature of the structure and the fact that it's changing and the fact that there are likely transport limitations may actually warrant different methods of delivering molecules. So if we come back to the <coughs> bigger picture of the two um, areas that I've talked about, I was able to show you that um, cellular aggregation and EB size both influence differentiation via the adhesions that form between these, um, these stem cells in a three-dimensional <laughs> microenvironment. But more than that, that we were able to control these microenvironments using this platform that I've developed. And this allows us to really ask more questions about three-dimensional um, embryonic stem cell morphogenesis because we are able to um, control certain aspects of it while asking questions about others. Um, and then the second part of this was that um, by treating our embryoid bodies with soluble factors, we're not only changing differentiation, but we're changing morphogenesis. And that morphogenesis alters the physical properties of embryoid bodies, which um, obviously there's a lot of inter interrelated signaling and complex things going on with this, within this microenvironment, which warrants um, further studies. And ultimately, our idea is that understanding this three-dimensional morphogenesis will hopefully enable the derivation of complex fi functional microtissues for regenerative therapies. I would like to thank my advisor, Todd McDevitt, and the entire McDevitt lab, as well as our collaborators in the Glazer lab, um, funding sources, again, the Sudath family, and I will take any questions. We have a few minutes left for a couple of questions. So you just showed uh, one example with the actin assembly affecting mm -hmm. the, the strength. You saw differential effects with two different actin disassembly. Are you able, are there other factors you can try and look at actin assembly and see if that is also differential? Or? 
there are different things. And we are trying to look at also the phenotype downstream of both of those things to get a better idea of what exactly they're doing. Um, one caveat to that is that one of the inhibitors that we use is a ROC inhibitor. So it's not just causing actin disassembly. That's actually more widespread um, pertur perturbation of the cytoskeleton. There is certainly a lot of heterogeneity within the spheroids, especially as they differentiate. Um, and that is something that we're, a lot of groups are looking at trying to control via multiple of these different methods. Um, the best that we have been able to do is by really controlling that size um, from the very beginning of formation. Um, that hopefully will help to um, distribute the heterogeneity across the population to make them more uniform across populations. Oh yeah, um, also in serum versus serum free media makes a really big difference also as far as heterogeneity arising within these embryo bodies. To what extent does uh, uh, EB density influence the, the differentiation process? Embryo body density like within a culture dish? Yeah. Um, I think that that does influence differentiation because there are soluble factors that are being secreted by embryo bodies. And they're obviously uptaking um, a lot of the culture media and nutrients and things along those lines. I think below a certain threshold, um, it probably doesn't influence it all that much. But I, there's definitely signaling between populations. So we try to control that, again, as much as possible. But there's certainly heterogeneity arising from that as well. So as a follow-up question, if currently you're using a batch culture mm -hmm. right, to do it. But if you could imagine using a continuous culture where you're continue, you're keeping your, your uh, soluble factors at a constant, but you expect to see change. That's one of the ideas, um, definitely, as, as far as transport and changing um, the culture environment. It might be necessary that some, of, some people have looked at actually sweeping out some of the media and continually refreshing it. Some of the factors they secrete actually might be necessary for differentiation. Um, but at the same time, it gives us more control of knowing exactly what's in the microenvironment. So there's a couple of different areas where you can think about um, capturing what they're secreting, but also trying to sweep it away and um, only deliver what you're delivering to those embryo bodies.